of us would like to jump on an airplane and take our ultrasound machine to a resource limited setting and begin to care for patients. However, I would encourage you to think through all the possibilities before you begin and get on your airplane. Will your ultrasound machine actually fit into the electrical outlet in the country that you're going to? If you have a 120 machine, will it fit with 240? Will the plug itself fit into the electrical outlet? And what if you go to a place where there is no electricity at all, which is very common in resource limited settings? How long will your battery last? How many batteries do you take? What's the wattage of your machine if you're going to recharge it? What about heat of the machine if you're scanning in a desert or a jungle or a tropical area where the ambient temperature is very high, do you risk burning out your machine? What about those probes? Are they going to work at 8,000 feet altitude and when the temperature drops below zero? Or how about in the jungle? I've scanned as high as 124 degrees outside. Will your ultrasound probes actually work and will your machine work? What about your gel? How many bottles of gel do you need for two or three or four or five weeks of scanning? Or perhaps you're thinking about making your own gel and do you have supplies to do that? And do you know how the gel is going to function at a high temperature or a low temperature? I'm Dr. Ted Kuhn and I've been all over the world scanning and I'd like to share some of the pearls that I've learned throughout the years scanning in resource limited settings. Another question that we really need to discern is whether or not we're going to teach ultrasound to the local physicians or healthcare providers in the country where we go. And if we are going to teach them, what curriculum are, going, are we going to use? How long will it take? How many scans do they need to do before they're competent? And especially, how are you going to follow them up in a quality assurance or quality improvement program? So let's get started. This is kind of exciting and fun for me. We've been preparing this a long time for you, and I hope you enjoy it. A couple of years ago, we kind of did an interesting study to see how effective and how useful ultrasound would be in resource limited settings. We set up an ultrasound station on the outside of a clinic. Patients were seen by seasoned physicians given a diagnosis and treatment. And then after discharge, we actually scanned those patients to see if there would be any difference in their diagnosis or treatment. We found that 20% of the time that the addition of an ultrasound significantly changed the diagnosis or treatment in the patient. This is especially true in resource limited settings where there is no CT or MRI or an extended lab. Thus, we would conclude that uh, ultrasound indeed is very useful in settings uh, without other ancillary uh, resources. There are several problems that we need to think through before we advocate the use of ultrasound in resource limited settings. The first is the initial training. If you're going to train someone in a resource limited setting, how much time do you need and what is the curriculum? Not everyone is equally good at doing ultrasound. Is the person you're investing in in training going to be able to actually do the ultrasound since ultrasound is very operator dependent? The third question that always arises is the cost of the initial equipment. Some equipment can be very expensive. How are you going to pay for it? How are you going to maintain it? What about environmental issues? What if it's very hot where you're going or very cold or if it's at altitude? Or what if the electricity is not so good? And how are you going to assure that there's continuous quality assurance and improvement. We want everyone that we train and we work with to get better and better as they scan over a period of time. How are you going to teach them? How are you going to train them? And how are you going to assure that the scans are accurate uh, from the patient's perspective and benefit? First issue perhaps that we need to examine is the amount and quality of the initial training. Training around the world varies and unfortunately there's no real standard for training. Some training is excellent in ultrasound and some is not so good. Some may be one to one and a half years, others may just be a day or two. And obviously the initial training makes a huge impact on the ability of the sonographer to scan accurately. There are multiple paths to training in ultrasound. In Western countries, we actually have credentialing and we have organizations that are dedicated to training and to excellence in ultrasound. Many of us hold an RDMS, a Registered Diagnostic Medical Sonographer credential, which would be very difficult or almost impossible in the developing world. Most often people are mentored by a sonographer or a sonologist, but this is very time consuming and labor intensive. It means someone has to be one-on-one -on -one scanning with somebody else to train them over a long period of time. There are technical schools in developing countries. Again, there's no standardization. Some may be excellent, giving lots of hands-on training and lots of academic and uh, lecture time. Others may be very poor with minimal training. 
and mineral hands-on time. Most often, scanners in the developing world just learn on their own. They pick up the ultrasound and begin scanning. There's no standardization, no quality control, and no quality improvement. There are resources available for training in the developing world. The first is from the World Health Organization and is fortunately available as a free download from the World Health Organization site. The second one, the Manual of Ultrasound for Resource Limited Settings by Shaw, is also available as a free download from Partners in Health. Ultrasound is also very operator dependent. What that means is some people do an excellent job and other people, in spite of training, just have a hard time scanning. In ultrasound, you can make a diagnosis on a patient by what you see, but you can also injure a patient by what you don't see. So it's all completely dependent upon the skills of the sonographer and how well they've been trained and how well they scan. Of course, scanning requires knowledge as well, for the eye does not see what the mind does not know. If you don't know the material that's being covered, your eye won't see it on the ultrasound. Even if you're well trained and using good equipment, scanning in the developing world can still be very challenging. I remember this child. It was in a place where it was high heat, high humidity, unreliable electricity. There was no ventilation and we had a sick squirming child. We were concerned that this child may have pyloric stenosis and the diagnosis made a big difference to us. There was no reliable intensive care unit for children or pediatric surgeon within many, many miles. So making the diagnosis made a real difference in our disposition of this patient. I think one of the most common questions I get from people who want to scan in resource limited settings is, what machine should I take? Should I buy a machine? Should I rent a machine? Or are they even available for renting? Or will the company actually loan me one? Or some companies perhaps would give you one? Well, that's a complex question, and I can't really recommend any one particular brand to you. I will tell you that the machines are getting smaller and lighter, and the image quality is getting better. However, image quality and price don't always follow. Some of the first generation machines, which are very inexpensive, have beautiful images and may be all that you really need for what you're going to do. On the other hand, a more expensive machine may be more than what you need, particularly if you're teaching in resource limited settings. Think through ahead of time what it is you're trying to accomplish and what it is you're trying to do. In this section, we'll talk about first and second and third generation machines. I'll also give you a little bit of idea about function and price so that you can better answer the question for yourself. Another thought that you might have is, are you going to leave this machine behind for use and training in the country where you're going? And if you are, perhaps the best answer to your question is you should probably buy the machine in the country where you're going so it can be serviced if it should get broken. I hope these are some of the thoughts you have. Now let's begin and see what machines are available out there. The first thing we need to think through is the cost of the equipment. Whether you're thinking of a first, second, or third generation machine, and some of the third generation machines now have enhanced capability to do 3D imaging. Cost is always at the bottom of our decision. The first generation machines can be quite inexpensive, whereas the third generation machines, especially with enhanced functioning, can be quite, uh, quite expensive. There is not always a linear relationship between image quality and the cost of the machine. The cost of the machine generally is in the transducer head and has to do with the number of piezoelectric cells in each transducer head. This was the first machine I ever really used in the developing world. It was a first generation machine, lightweight, portable, and almost indestructible. You can see from the image at the bottom, which is an aconococcal cyst, that the image quality was quite acceptable for our use and purposes. This is also an example of a first generation machine. It was a little bigger and a little heavier than the 180 plus on the previous slide, although the screen was larger and it had increased functionality, including color flow Doppler and power Doppler, which was not available on the earlier machines. The second generation machines like this Sonosite Titan really looked pretty much like the third generation machines. However, they didn't include the functionality that the current third generation machines now have. The third generation machines really don't distinguish themselves in the way they look or by their size or weight. Really the difference between the first and second generation machines and the third generation machines is the quality of the image that is produced with the newer machines. This is a third generation machine that actually is about the size and portability of the old first generation Sonosite 180 Plus. 
There's recently been a lot of interest in the small handheld portable ultrasound machines. These are not that expensive. The image quality is quite good. However, it reminds me of looking at an image on a cell phone. For those of us who have been used to larger screens and better definition, uh, these still fall short. However, I think in the next couple of years, as technology improves and increases, uh, these will become more and more a viable option. I don't want to give the impression that we're only recommending one or two different manufacturers of machines. There are many machines out there that are quite good and quite acceptable and would be useful for training and teaching in the developing world. These are just a few of them, and I'm sure that there are others as well. As I mentioned at the beginning of this module, perhaps your best choice is a machine that you could purchase in-country so that it can be repaired should repairs become necessary. As I alluded to in the introduction, there are a lot of things to consider when taking an ultrasound machine into the developing world, not the least of which are environmental issues. Will your ultrasound overheat? Will there be sufficient electricity? Do you have time to recharge? Are you going to need multiple batteries? Will the electricity actually harm your machine? Or will you actually be able to plug it in? If you're thinking about using solar panels to recharge, how many watts is your machine? And how long will it take to recharge in direct sun? What happens if it rains all day? That ultrasound gel that you're taking with you, will it work in 120 degree temperature? Or what if it goes below freezing? Will you be able to use it then? How about altitude? A lot of places that we go are actually at moderate to extreme altitude and going to places that are seven or eight or nine or 10 or 12,000 feet or above is not uncommon these days with a travel being so easy. Well, let's think about some of these things ahead of time and I hope to be able to provide you some answers so that when you get there, you won't be surprised and you will actually be able to accomplish what you're setting out to do. In this section, we'll cover most of the environmental issues that you'll come up against. The first one is electrical power, including power surges, whether or not to use an inverter or a solar panel, and then we'll address heat and cold issues and altitude. Let me give you an example from my own life. I'm standing in the background by the light in the back by the door. We had been on a team to a rural area where we were going to be scanning for three weeks. I had my normal ultrasound machine and we also had brought one back up. I was told that there was no electricity in the village, so we had secured a generator, and I thought, gee, that'll be great, because with the generator, we'll have constant electricity when we need it, and I'll be able to run my ultrasound machine whenever I want. The generator was fired up, and within a couple of minutes, somebody pointed out that there was smoke coming from the back of my ultrasound machine. I immediately went and unplugged my ultrasound machine, and the power brick that puts power into the back of the ultrasound machine it was so hot that it burned my hands and there was smoke coming out of the power brick. I immediately shut down my ultrasound machine and tried to examine to see what had happened and the machine itself booted up and was alright but the power brick was completely destroyed. I asked them later why this happened and they said oh well this is a 240 volt machine that because we use it for the entire village we turn it up as high as it'll go so that even the last house in the village can have electricity and can have electric lights. And they told me that they thought that the voltage was somewhere near 420 volts. So there I am on my first day of scanning, not even five or ten minutes into scanning, and my ultrasound machine is without ability to recharge. Well, thankfully, we had a second machine. We were able to use that machine, and we used it uh, with a recharging solar panel. So we were successful. But that would have been a disaster, and it was a disaster. It would have been even more of a disaster if I hadn't had a backup machine. Power outages are very common in the developing world. Sometimes you have reliable power and other times there are rolling power outages. They may even proportion you a time of the day when you would have power. You may decide to run your clinic and scan from 9 to 5. Well, perhaps your power is going to be there from 5 to 6 so that you'd have no electricity all day and then have electricity during a part of the day when you weren't planning on scanning. So it's best to be prepared. This is a village we actually hiked into. It was a village with no electricity. I had to carry my ultrasound in a backpack on my back. Well, what if you're in a situation like this? How do you make your ultrasound work? One option would be an inverter. You can take an inverter and hook it onto an automobile car battery and run your power cord into your ultrasound machine and charge your ultrasound machine that way. If you are concerned about the battery in the car running low, you can disconnect your ultrasound machine and run the car for a few minutes and let the alternator recharge the battery. 
This is a simple and effective method that we've used and developed at the Medical College of Georgia for running our ultrasound machines in places without electricity. It consists of a solar panel that you can see lying out there. The silver box over there is actually a lithium ion battery and the little orange box that you see below that is a power inverter. And what we do is we take the solar panel and hook it into the lithium ion battery to recharge the battery. Then we hook the battery into the power inverter and the power inverter goes to the back of our ultrasound machine to recharge the ultrasound machine. You can also use several solar panels hooked together in parallel to increase the wattage. This can be extremely effective in places where there's no electricity, especially in places where there's a lot of sun. Here we are in the Sahel Desert in Mali, West Africa, using our little system in a place that doesn't have electricity to recharge our scanner so we can scan all day long. One thing that Mali and the Sahel Desert does have is a lot of sunlight, so we have no trouble recharging our batteries. This was on an expedition to Mount Everest, where one of our residents actually carried an ultrasound machine on his back, as well as a solar panel and inverter, so that he could do ultrasounds at extreme altitude without having to worry about electrical supply. Some machines don't require very much wattage to run. This little machine didn't have a battery, and we were able to actually use the solar panel to charge the lithium ion battery and run it through an inverter to run our machine. We were able to scan from morning till night just using the electrical power supplied through the solar panel through the lithium ion battery uh, without any difficulty. You might want to know if ultrasound machines actually work at altitude. We tried to find this out from our manufacturers and nobody could actually give us a good idea. However, here's one of our residents scanning at almost 20,000 feet on his way up to Everest. There's no problems at all with the machine. Well, how about scanning at extremes of environmental temperatures? Here I am in the Sahel Desert again. It was about 105 inside the little room where I was scanning and about 114 or more outside. I had had to drink five to six liters of fluid and I think I was still dehydrated. If you read the manufacturer's recommendations, it says you probably shouldn't scan above 90 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Although here we are in the Sahel Desert, much above that in the machine work flawlessly. I do think that if you're scanning at high ambient temperatures, it's a good idea to take a cooling fan with you. These are inexpensive little fans that people buy for their laptops. I have been scanning at high ambient temperatures and put my hand underneath this ultrasound machine and almost burned my hand because it was so hot. I think the idea of putting a cooling fan underneath the machine makes good sense and protects your investment in the machine. Heat and ultrasound gel is a completely different matter. I found that the hotter the temperature, the more liquid the ultrasound gel gets. When you get to 105 or so ambient temperature, the ultrasound gel runs out like water. When you put it on somebody's abdomen or some other body part, it immediately evaporates and dries, so within seconds you have to reapply. On the other hand, it seems though ultrasound gel works quite well at cold temperatures, except of course for putting cold gel on somebody's abdomen. At minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit, the gel did not freeze and was used quite effectively at scanning at altitude, even at this ambient temperature. It may not look cold in this photograph, but let me tell you that it was very cold. I've got a jacket on underneath that white coat, and I'm still very cold, and the woman I'm scanning has multiple layers of blankets on. Nevertheless, we were at altitude and at extreme cold, and the ultrasound machine worked exceptionally well. When scanning at extremes of temperature, especially in the cold, I do notice that there is a degradation of the image below 35 degrees Fahrenheit. I think this has to do with the probes and not the machine, and can be easily fixed by just detaching the probes from the machine and putting them in your pocket for a while and heating them up before you begin to scan. We've scanned at 35 degrees with probes that were not warmed and the image quality was quite poor. We've taken the same probe and put it in our pocket for a few minutes to heat up the probe and scan the same patients to find that our image quality was quite acceptable. This is an image of a liver done with an abdominal probe where we scanned at 35 degrees or actually a little below 35 degrees without heating up the probe. And you can see the degradation of the image, especially in the far field. If you heat up the probe, as I mentioned in the previous slide, you get rid of this degradation of the image quite nicely. Have you thought through about how you're going to clean your machine, especially the probes? The CDC says that every time a patient is scanned with intact skin, that the probe should be cleaned with soap and water or a light detergent. Every time a probe 
touches infected skin, it needs to be disinfected. And there are three or four disinfectants that we commonly use, like glutaraldehyde. How are you going to do that in the developing world? Oftentimes when we scan, it's not unusual to scan patients with HIV. We certainly do that all the time. We scan patients with TB. We scan patients with echinococcal cysts and with fungal diseases. We scan patients with amoebic abscesses and bacterial abscesses, tropical pyomyositis. This is what we're all about and this is what we do. But let's be safe about it, safe for ourselves and safe for our, our patients. So let's protect our machines, ourselves and our patients by appropriately cleaning and maintaining our ultrasound machines. In this short section, we'll discuss some of the options you have for cleaning your machine. Here's a wonderful example of the problem. This is a patient that is just post-op. The patient had a pyogenic liver abscess drained, and I'd been asked to see the patient to see if there's remaining pus in the liver. He had a bag on, as shown above, and I'm sure that the skin was uh, highly contaminated. So I'm scanning the patient. The question becomes when I'm done, how do I disinfect or how do I clean my probes? Perhaps the simplest and easiest thing you can do is just wash the probe with soap and water. You can use hand soap like I do, which contains chlorhexidine if you're scanning in the hospital, or just a mild detergent soap like you would use for dishwashing. The CDC recommends that you disconnect the probe from your machine so that you can also clean the cord. All probes are watertight uh, down to the base of the cord, so you don't have to fear getting the probe wet. This removes most of the old gel, and it also removes an amazingly large amount of infected material, including bacteria and viruses. It's a good way to start. Multiple manufacturers recommend against using alcohol-based cleaners or disinfectants on their ultrasound probes. Apparently, the alcohol can degrade the tip of the probe. Also, as you can see, the bottles are quite large and you can't carry them on airplanes if you go through TSA security. This is a nice solution to our question about how do we maintain and clean our ultrasound probes. After we clean it with soap and water, we may want to put a disinfectant on the probe that doesn't damage the probe like alcohol might damage it. This is a product called Protex, and I'm sure there are many other manufacturers that make similar products, but this one I like because it comes in a 50 cc bottle. It's a little spray bottle, which is below the maximum that you can carry through TSA and airport security, so you won't get in problem uh, carrying this in your carry-on. As you can read from the information on the slide, it will kill most of the pathogens that you're concerned about transmitting, including HIV, hepatitis B, and C, and herpes, and staph, and pseudomonas, and MRSA. Recently, Protex has also made these in little packets. They are about the size of an alcohol wipe, and you can take the individual packets with you, and you can actually carry quite a few of these in a very small space, which then uh, no longer is a problem with TSA because it's not uh, fluid. I hadn't mentioned this before, but one of the simplest and easiest ways to protect your ultrasound probe is to cover it with a probe cover. You can fill this with ultrasound gel and put it over top your probe so that the probe never actually comes in direct physical contact with infectious materials. Still, after your scanning, you need to remove the probe cover and wash it with soap and water. And if you've been in a particularly dirty environment with MRSA or some other infectious agent, it's always best to dis disinfect it as well. The question often arises as to how much ultrasound gel should I carry for a scanning session of one week or two weeks or three weeks or whatever it is you're going to be. And ultrasound gel tends to be fairly heavy. And if you put it in your carry-on, uh, it won't go through TSA. And if you fill your bag with ultrasound gel uh, that you're going to check through, it becomes very heavy. There's been a lot of talk about making your own ultrasound gel in resource limited setting with guar gum or other similar compounds. I've tried this many times and I've varied the formula multiple times. I've never really found anything that has been completely suitable. Perhaps this is the best method. I've actually had chefs invited to help me to try to vary the formula to make it more acceptable. But at this point, I think, although this is not the best that we could probably do, it may be the best that we have for the moment. Let me demonstrate one way of making ultrasound gel. This is guar gum, which you can get from any manufacturer online. You can take two tablespoons of the guar gum and two tablespoons of the salt and put it in a little baggie and throw it in your carry-on or your check-through. And when you get there, you're ready to make your ultrasound gel. Once you've arrived at your destination, you can heat up one liter of water and stir the guar gum salt 
combination into the water a little at a time. You will notice that it clumps, that's why you don't put all of it in at the same time. You stir it until the material has been dissolved before you put in the next tablespoon. I save the empty ultrasound containers from the hospital. I bring them home and put them in my dishwasher to clean them and then I carry them empty into the field. And then we can put the hot ultrasound gel that we've just made into the containers. One also thing that is nice about this is that if you do boil it, the ultrasound gel is sterile. Here I am on my back porch demonstrating the viscosity of commercially available ultrasound gel. This is the Guire Gum homemade ultrasound gel that I just made in the kitchen. It has been cooled down and you can see that the viscosity is considerably lower than homemade ultrasound gel. This becomes important uh, when you're scanning because you'll need more of it and also as you scan in hotter environments the homemade ultrasound gel literally becomes like water. This is the same homemade Guire Gum ultrasound gel that you saw on the previous slide. I've let it sit for four days. You can see now that the viscosity is even less than it was on the day after it was made. Uh, this becomes problematic in that you may have to make up your gel on a daily or every other daily basis. Also noted, but uh, you can't tell on this slide, is after three or four days, this gel actually begins to have an unacceptable odor, which can be noticed by patients and scanners alike. This may not be the best solution. If anyone out there knows of a better solution, please let me know. Many of us would like to go into resource limited settings with our ultrasound machine and train somebody there who will be left behind to do the ultrasound examinations. Before we do that, we may want to think about quality assurance and quality improvement. Most likely, the sites will be geographically isolated from where you are. You may travel to Africa or South America or Asia to do your training and eventually you'll get on an airplane and come back to your home country. With the ultrasound locations being geographically isolated, how then do you make sure that the ultrasound and the sonographer are doing appropriate exams? Really, there will be minimal ongoing training. So you're not there. How are you going to train somebody when you're not there? All of us need feedback on performance on our exams. No matter how long we've been scanning, it's good to know when you've done a good job, but it's also equally important to know when you haven't done an adequate exam, and we all have been in that situation. So there's a need for continued supervision and a quality assurance. And before you get on that airplane and go, let's think through some of the possibilities of how that might occur. Well, here are some possibilities for remote quality assurance. Direct oversight uh, may or may not be possible. If there is direct oversight, it may mean that you need to remain in the location for many months or years. Some of us are willing to commit that, others certainly not. It may mean frequent visitation throughout the year, and that also becomes problematic because it's expensive to travel back and forth to remote sites. And most of us, if not all of us, have commitments in our home as well, not only families, but our job. Well, how about offline QA, meaning mail? Well, mail's pretty slow, especially if it's coming from the developing world, if it's really going to make a difference. And in mail, you're probably going to look at static images, not video clips. Telephone consultation is also possible, and I've had this before with a sonographer trying to describe to me on the telephone what he or she has seen. The problem there is you can't really review the images, and if you can't see the images, it's hard to make a recommendation. Well, how about web-based teleconferencing? Well, we've done this at MCG. I'd like to share with you our results. It does mean that you have to have high-speed internet, which may cut out some locations around the world. A couple of years ago, we decided to invest ourselves and some time in training physicians in resource-poor settings. We actually went to the countries and spent several weeks with the physician scanning on their machine. We limited our scans to one or two anatomical areas that the physician thought was most helpful in their daily practice. Each physician had to complete approximately 150 scans before we left, and all of these were peer-reviewed. Then the question remained, how do we provide quality assurance or quality improvement after we leave? How can we be sure that the ultrasound machine is being properly used and patients are being properly diagnosed? We couldn't see everything in the two weeks that we were there. But we decided to try an online video conferencing program where ultrasounds were video streamed to us in a conference room back in the United States for review. And here's what we found. 
The web-based teleconferencing allowed us to link computer to computer and view digital images, video, and audio at the same time. It allowed for us to discuss the images with the sonographer or sonologist, uh, as well as patient outcomes. We did this in real time so that if we needed to see an image or a different view of an organ, the sonographer on the other end of the video conferencing was actually able to turn the probe so we could see the anatomical area that we were interested in. There are multiple options in using web-based teleconferencing. It seems as though there are new sites and new possibilities that arise almost daily. And it also seems as though our broadband width is increasing here in the United States. There is a little bit of a cost in the initial investment for software and for equipment, but this is a one-time cost and uh, doesn't involve continued cost. There are multiple options. We tried all of them and we found that OVO and Skype were perhaps the best, the most available, and the cheapest in the long run. We tried this with video links and web-based teleconferencing in Asia and Africa and South America. Each one of those locations had their own special problems. However, in the end, uh, we were able to do teleconferencing in all those sites uh, using one of the two below mentioned software programs. In the end, we found this to be successful. However, it did require a fairly high speed internet connection, which was not available in all countries. It also it required a fair amount of faculty time for the feedback. It did allow for ultrasound education for those in the field. It allowed us as faculty actually to see some pretty interesting clips that were sent to us from different places around the world. One of the scans did result in a change in diagnosis which was significant. It was the diagnosis of gallbladder cancer which you can see in this image below. It was called gallbladder sludge and obviously has blood flow through it which makes it gallbladder cancer. All the participants in the developing world had a positive response to the training and actually loved it. At several sessions, we were able to hook our site from South America and Africa and Asia together. So the scanners in Asia were able to see the South American and African images and vice versa. And it allowed for a real congenial time of education and training. Well, we really haven't talked about what we scan when we travel. Not everything is tropical infectious diseases. I would guess about 60% of what we scan is actually abdominal scans. This is actually a photograph taken with one of the early machines, the Sonosite 180 Plus, in a gentleman who has an enlarged liver and enlarged spleen. You can see me at this point scanning the spleen, and if you look at the image on that first generation machine, you'll see that the image is pretty good, which again demonstrates what I said at the beginning, that quality and price don't always go together. This machine is quite acceptable. Abdominal complaints are very common in the developing world, probably the most common presenting complaint we have. This is just a scan showing cirrhosis and ascites. Women's health care clearly seems to be underrepresented in the developing world, and there are many countries and areas within countries where women's health care is virtually non-existent. I would guess that probably 20% of our scans in the developing world are for female GU complaints. And sometimes we will go into rural areas and we'll say we'll only see women with GU complaints uh, because otherwise they have no access to care at all. This is an example of a large pedunculated fibroid uterus. This is a 38-year-old with vaginal bleeding who bled for four years and had a hemoglobin of 4.4. There was nowhere to go for help. At least we were able to tell her what the problem was and tell her what needed to be done. This was an older woman with left lower quadrant abdominal pain for years. We scanned her and found a serous cystadenocarcinoma. As you can see from the photo, even though it was not a good diagnosis, she was delighted to know what the problem was. Again, after they at least know what the problem is, steps can be taken to provide care for her. I think in just about every country that I've been where I've done pelvic scans, particularly if I have an endovaginal probe, I found a molar pregnancy. It seems to be much more common than we have in the United States. I'm not sure why, but this obviously can be life-saving for a young woman if diagnosed early. Of course, when we do OB scanning, we always need to be vigilant for that ectopic pregnancy. This is a young woman who had had one child and was with her husband trying to have a second child and came to us to evaluate her early pregnancy. The ultrasound scan showed a clear ectopic pregnancy and we were able to transport her over 100 miles from her rural village area to Phnom Penh where she was able to successfully have surgery. I recommend scanning women in the developing world in their first and third trimesters. 
the first trimester, you need to know how many babies are in there and whether there's an ectopic or not. In the third trimester, you need to know whether it's safe for women to be able to deliver at home. In this woman, she had a complete previa. We recommended not delivering at home. She was really not appropriate for delivery in the village. We get a lot of requests for scanning for infertility problems. And there are a lot of women who can't have a child and this is a big deal in the developing world, particularly if children are to work alongside their parents, providing income or working in the fields to provide food. There are a lot of things that you can scan for that you can see. I have found uh, didelphus uterus. Uh, we see submucosal fibroids, occasionally polycystic ovary disease. I'll occasionally find a varicocele in men, which may be the cause of their infertility. In this patient, I was somewhat surprised because she had an IUD. And that was an obvious reason why she couldn't get pregnant. And she didn't recall ever having an IUD put in place. In my experience, it's not that uncommon for women in the developing world to have IUDs put in place without their knowledge, especially in areas of the world where birth control is an issue. Lots of people will bring their children in with a request for scanning for congenital heart disease since the children aren't doing well or are not growing appropriately. Then there's a little bit of everything else. This is a young man who came in for a testicular mass. The ultrasound shows a clear tumor in the testicle, probably most likely a seminoma. We were able to send him to the capital city in this remote country. I don't know his follow-up, but hopefully it was taken care of appropriately. I hope you've enjoyed this video on using ultrasound in a resource limited setting. Certainly it's taken us years and many trips around the world to gather some of this information. You see that the idea and the imagination, perhaps, of doing ultrasound is a little bit different than the reality of doing it. So I hope this video has given you some ideas and hopefully will allow you to go scan successfully and teach in the developing world because that's what we all want. Uh, we want to help our patients wherever they are. Thanks for listening. Well, we'd really like for you to learn here. Learn here, then go forth and scan.